So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce some of you to a world that you might know. But looking around, I have a sense that most of you are going to be shocked by the world that I'm going to introduce you to. First of all, I'm going to introduce you into the world of pop culture that our young people live in, that most adults really don't know what's going on. And then I'm going to introduce you into the world of mainstream pornography that virtually all women don't know what's going on. Even women who claim they watch porn don't really know what's going on in mainstream porn that men watch. And what I'm going to show you is the connections between the two. So to begin, first of all, I'm looking around the room, and many of you are over the age of 35, would that be fair to say? Okay. So let me tell you, for those of you over the age of 30 are, your life is very different from people under that age. The reason is you were brought up in what we call a print-based culture, where the dominant form of communication was the printed word. Today, young people are brought up in what we call an image-based culture, where the dominant form of communication is the image, no longer the printed word. Now, let me say, as a culture, when we were print-based, we developed some immunization to the seduction of the eloquence of the printed word. We have no such immunization to the seduction of eloquence of the image. The image has a profound impact on you. It is everywhere and it is powerful in its ubiquity. And the problem is, is that most of us are image illiterate. We might learn how to read literature, but we never learn how to decode images. And that means that those who produce the images, the corporations, because virtually every image you see today is a corporate-based image, they have very little to tell but lots to sell, as George Gerbner once put it. So we are steeped in a corporate, commodified society whose language is an image that most of us are illiterate. Now, I know how powerful the image is, and I'll tell you why. When I was writing my book, Pornland, which I'm sorry to say has not arrived, because there was going to be a signing, but that's a whole other story, based on mainly my um, publisher. Um, when I was writing Pornland, I had the terrible misfortune of having to read 10 years of Cosmopolitan. So I'm going through Cosmopolitan, and here's me, who studied the image for 20 years. I understand how it's airbrushed. I understand how it's not real. And I'm going through Cosmopolitan, and I'm going, I hate it. I hate it, I hate it, I want to look like that, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Right? Because that's what it does. It seeps in. Because let's be honest, when we put down Cosmopolitan or Vogue or Vanity Fair, how do we feel? Like, we think, hmm, I feel really slim and toned today. I feel really good about myself. How do you really feel? Like a fat pig, would that be about right? Okay, that's crucial. Because the more women hate themselves, the more we build up the corporations. And what I want to argue is that the corporate globalization is built on the shoulders of Western women who loathe and hate and detest their bodies, and women in developing countries who produce for exploited wages the very products that we consume because we hate ourselves. There's a perfect synergy here. Okay. So let's talk about what this means. And I begin with this image because it's clearly a hideous image of him and a hideous image of her. This is what we call hegemonic masculinity and hegemonic femininity. The standard images that surround us. Now, she is completely airbrushed. She does not exist. But even as I say that to my students, as we're sitting there and saying, look, she's not real. She's a product of a machine. As I say that, I say to my students, how many of you are still comparing yourselves to her, even though you know she doesn't exist? And of course we all do. That is the power of the image. The image is what um, Patricia Hill Collins calls a controlling image. It controls our behavior, the way we think, the way we construct our identities. And that's also, by the way, true for him. And also what we're going to talk about is exactly what he's going to do to her in that position. Now what I want to do is to talk, walk you through the image-based culture. I want you to see the world that young people live in. And what you will notice, and these are just images I pulled from various magazines, 
is that they are dominated by the toned, young, white, occasionally a woman of color seeps in to mainstream culture, but it's largely a white controlled industry. Now, what happens here in terms of the way these images work is because they are everywhere, they begin to look normal. So I want you to think about something for a minute. And I'm just going to show you this. I always use this because this is Angelina Jolie before she became a child collector as a hobby. <laughs> Does nobody else think it's bizarre how having a child of color has become the new accessory for Hollywood stars? Now, what I want to do is sort of talk about how this body works and the way it constructs our identity as women. And I'm going to begin with some media theory. So there is a theory in media studies called the reader implied in the text. And what that means is that every single image has a reader in mind. They think about the target audience. So I want you to look at her. Look at her gaze, G-A-Z-E. And who is she speaking to? And before you answer, do you think she's speaking to her mother saying, let's go for a cup of coffee after the photo shoot? <laughs> so who is the implied spectator of this? A male. And what is she saying to him? Fuck me. Would you all agree? <laughs> right? This is what we call the fuck me lock. And I can tell you that we all as women know it because every single woman in this room virtually could go into the fuck me lock right now. Am I right? <laughs> Could you? Well, let's shout instructions to me. Come on, what does it look like? What do I do? Just stand here looking at you blankly. Glasses have to come off. This doesn't help, but nonetheless. Come on, what do I do? Right. Up, like this. Out. Where do I put my hands? Maybe something like this. Yeah, neck up. All of the... You all see what I'm doing? And you all know it because we are surrounded by it. Now, the problem with the fuck me look is that not only does it construct our identities as women as something to be looked at, okay, because the definition of femininity is looked atness. What it does as well is it sends profound messages to men. Men who yet are maybe pre-verbal are seeing these images everywhere. And what it is, is a visual offering of the female body. Now, you see, the thing is, she can't make good on her offer. The fuck me look cannot be made good because he hasn't got access to her. But who has he got access to? You and me. Okay. Which is why when women, sorry, which is why when women like Madonna, who talk about being empowered, sexually, and I'm going to talk about her later, but also younger women in pop culture, what they don't understand is they have bodyguards to protect them. We're the ones who pay the price of the hypersexualized culture, and not us, mainly younger women, because the prime rape age is what, 15 to 30. So what happens in this culture is that we construct masculine identities about the fact that men have a privilege and a right of access to female bodies. And not all men internalize that the same way. I want to make clear, I'm a sociologist, okay? Sociologists work on the basis of generalizations. What I say is not true for every male. But what I say is true for patterns of masculinity. And that's the difference. So let's think about how males are used to having this access. Let's think about how many women in this room have sat next to a guy on a train or a bus and he's sat too close for comfort and you've known something's not right, yes? Put your hand up who's had that experience. Okay, so you see this is a basic female experience. Okay, for the few men in the room, how many times have you had a woman sit too close to you and start rubbing your thigh up and down? One, okay, that's unusual, okay? <laughs> but why is this? Because those in power have the right to invade the private space of the powerless. That is a key symbolic act. And what I want to talk about is how 
Our silence is what feeds this. Now, this is not to blame women for their silence because we are socialized into it. But I'm going to give you a story of an event that happened to me, which I tell my students and they love. But it's a story about what happens when those who are oppressed refuse to act as oppressed. So I'm on the bus and I'm going to work. And I'm sitting down, I'm going to shout, and a man sits too close to me and I know something's going on. And he happens to have a newspaper across his crotch. So what they often do is they have the newspaper and off it comes. So I'm sitting there and I'm taking all this in very quickly. And I'm thinking, okay, now does anyone remember that old movie, Dirty Harry? Do you remember the scene where in Dirty Harry, Clint Eastwood has just gone after the bad guy and he's laying sprawled on the floor of the bad guy and he goes to get the gun and Dirty Harry leans over with him a gun and says, make my day. You know, that sort of macho, go on, do it, because I'm going to kill you, right? Well, I am sitting there thinking, make my day, you fucker, because you are going to be so sorry. <laughs> right, so sorry. This is the last time this is ever going to happen. So I've decided, I've got it all planned out. I've got icy cool, and I'm thinking, right, this is what I'm going to do. As he takes it off, I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to say, oh my God, everybody, look at this man's little penis and it's sticking right out. Gross, right? But you know what? He saw something smouldering in me. He saw it and he got off at the next stop. He knew he would picked the wrong one. And what happens here is as women, we have been socialized into acquiescence to our oppression. And when I say to my students who are 18 to 22, mainly white, middle class, I say, what would you have done in that situation? And most of them say they would have probably been paralyzed. Now, that is a socialized state. Because let me tell you, if one man did that to another man, he'd beat the shit out of him, am I right? Men have not been socialized into paralysis the same way that we have. So what is important, and this is what socialized me out of paralysis, was one thing and one thing only, feminism, right? It knocked me away. I thought I was alive before feminism, but it turned out I was comatose, okay? Only with feminism did I realize what life looked like. And when I say feminism, I mean radical feminism. I mean that in your face, take no prisoners, we've had enough feminism, okay? Which is what I'm gonna talk about today. And I have to tell you, Every radical feminist, I feel, should have a son, as I do, because it is wonderful for one's politics. Because when I was younger, I had this great, great notion of the world. Women are good and men are bad. And then you have a son, and it fucks up that whole dichotomy, okay? <laughs> because you don't think like that anymore. Because we love our sons, okay? And we do not want this for our sons. We want better than this. I want better than a predator for my son. So I'm going to talk a lot about what it was like as a radical feminist, married to a man who is a pro-radical feminist. So I wasn't fighting him. We were in this together, saving the soul of our boy so he would not be socialized into hegemonic masculinity. So what I want to make clear is it is not men that's the problem, but hegemonic mainstream masculinity that robs us, but also robs them of their humanity. So let's talk about, continue how these images work. So what's really funny is I've been doing this for so many years and I am actually married to a man who is probably the most image illiterate man I've ever met. So when I brought this home, he looked at it and said, why are they using the same woman eight times? <laughs> now, in a way, he's, he was wrong, but really he was right because they are all the same. As long as you conform to flat stomachs, big breasts, toned thighs, Blonde is better usually. Then you know what? We are the same. Because women in media have no past, no future, no wants, no goals, no aims, no history, no aspirations, nothing. They're just a selection of body parts delivered up. And what gets ripped away from women in our pop culture is any notion of individuality, integrity, creativity, agency, all the things that make us human get replaced by the perfect body. And should you not conform to that, which many, none of us do, of course, 
then you are taught to be self-loathing. And that, again, has a profound effect because groups that loathe themselves will not advocate for themselves. If they just could lose that extra 10 pounds, things would be better. No, if we overthrew patriarchy, things would be better, <laughs> right? Losing the 10 pounds, sisters, is not gonna do it, let me tell you. So this is the notion of all the same. But you know what's interesting? Is even when you're not all the same, even when you have reached the top of your career, as these women have, this is Vanity Fair two years ago, right before the Oscars. These were all the nominees for the top actors, supporting actresses. So you would all agree these are at the top of their career. What do you notice about all the women? Unclothed. And what do you notice about the men? You see, now I could tolerate this if these guys were in speedo shorts or something. That would be fair. But notice how they are covered and she is uncovered. It is no accident that in prisons, the first thing they make prisoners do is strip. Because to be unclothed, naked, in the face of people who are clothed is to render you vulnerable. And in fact, what I would argue is that femininity is a vulnerable status that we are socialized into. Women are not raped by accident. As I say to my students, rape is a form of over-conformity to the norms and values, not deviance. The question we should be asking in our culture is not do why do men rape? That I understand. It's why do not all men rape? What blocks some men from internalizing the values of the culture to the point that that bitch whore cunt deserves to be raped? That's what we should be studying. What is the resilience of some men who refuse to buy into this? So we need to begin to think about rape not as a form of deviance, but as a form of over-conformity. And when I get into pornography, you will see that the actual narrative of pornography is a rape that she enjoys. And it's never rape. It's always, of course, because she likes it. So these are the kinds of things we need to be thinking about when we look at the intersection of images and ideology. Images construct the way we think in the world. They jump off the pages and into our lives, our identities, our sexualities. And you know what? We didn't get to create these. The corporations created them. So we, as most oppressed groups, are at the mercy of one's oppressor to define who you are in the world. I doubt if somebody would have sat down with us, we would have decided that yes, thongs and shoes you can't walk in are a really good idea for us. Could you imagine men walking around in thongs and high heel shoes? Could you imagine them dripping hot wax onto genital areas to get rid of all of their hair? Right, absolutely not. So these are, we, you live within the ideology of those who have got something to gain from your oppression. Now, what's interesting, I remember growing up, as some of you will, and I'm sorry that I keep leaning on this and making a noise, but I need to take pressure off my ankle. Um, you will probably remember, some of you who are older, growing up in a time when you were not fixated on your body. There was a time in childhood when you thought your body was pretty great, okay? It worked, it moved, it had all these things. My students have no memory of that. No memory. For them, their body has always been something to be looked at. That is a terrible, terrible loss. Imagine just you, all of you in the room, the women, if you had never in your life ever seen an image of a woman in a magazine. Imagine how differently you would feel about your body. My assumption is you would feel very different. So think about what has been ripped away from us that this is what surrounds us, this image of the body that none of us can aspire to. And again, the most important thing about it is that it's not only thin, it has to be hypertoned, it has to be disciplined, it has to be bolted down. There is something in our culture that fears women's appetites. Everything has to be pleased and controlled and bolted down, and that includes our flesh. 
And remember, the big issue of all of this is that there is no shortage of products to spend your money on. If tomorrow women in the West woke up and decided they really liked their bodies, just think how many industries would go out of business. The cosmetic industry, the clothing industry, the diet industry, the gym industry, and then think of all the allied industries that support those industries. So when I say that global capitalism is dependent upon women hating themselves, I'm not exaggerating here. And in my classes, I show a film about Avon in Brazil. Because Avon goes to Brazil, and it sells skin whiteners. And it sells to women living in, up on the Amazon, where the only place you can get to them is on a boat. They are spending $40 a month on skin whiteners. That's an Avon marketing practice. And when you see this image, the children have no shoes on because they can't afford shoes. Now, of course, we know that Brazil is color-coded and that the way out of poverty is sold to these women as white as skin. Okay, this is not stupid women. This is women trying to figure out a way out of conditions which they did not create for themselves. And in come the corporations and, of course, target them and exploit them for all of their poverty. Now, I want you to look at these and tell me what similarities you see in these images. Okay, so what do you notice about all of these? No face. But let me ask you a question. Do you really need a face if you've got nice legs? I mean, honestly, right? How important is that? Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you do to yourselves what the media do? That is, you cut yourself up into bits and pieces in the mirror and decide what's nice and what's not. And let me tell you, I bet most things need work, am I right? Oh, this needs work, this, everything needs work. Now, what happens when you cut yourself up into bits and pieces is you lose the integrity of the wholeness of the body. That's what goes out the door. And certainly working with college students, it is astounding to me the way this has colonized their minds. The amount of time they spend at the gym, and this is not for health reasons, right? This is to look a certain way. The rampant eating disorders, which are connected to things other than just body image, okay? I mean, those are complicated, as we all know. But it is interesting that one of the pathologies that shows itself is through the body, i.e. eating disorders. Because when you think about it, the dispossessed do not have many places to make political statements. The body is often one of the few places on which the dispossessed can make a political statement. See, if you're wealthy, you've got all sorts of other ways to do it. The poorer you are, the more only the body is. Which is why when you go to gyms, it's mainly working class men who are pumping up. Because the only way they can reenact and perform masculinity is the body. Wealthy men can buy a really nice car, deck out a woman in lots of jewelry, big house. The working class guy only has the body on which to write the script of his masculinity. But just a minute, help is on its way. Dove. We're saved. We have three women in the media who look somewhat like us, who do prance around in their underwear all day, but we won't talk about that. So was this a big thing in Canada, the Dove campaign? So everyone's talking about this. Well, let me tell you something about Dove. Dove is owned by Unilever, which owns SlimFast, right? So so much for loving your body because slim fast wrecks your body. Any of those drinking diets wrecks your body. So can you see how they've got you on both ends? You might like your body a bit, you can use Dove. You hate it, you use slim fast. You vacillate, you got both of them. Right? This is what corporations do. They tie us up in knots because the goal of a corporation is not to take care of you or me. It is to maximize profit. And as we know, Right? If they have to bring the world to the edge of economic disaster in order to maximize profits, so they will do that. 
because we were on the verge of economic disaster. And for many people, that verge was crossed. They lost their homes. They've lost everything. In the United States of America, African-American gains since the post-civil rights era has been virtually wiped out through the recession. Certain groups carried the burden of the recession more than other groups. Now the latest thing, okay? And if anything makes me crazy, it's this. So let's think about this. Today, and let me go back a bit and talk about Karl Marx. Karl Marx, when you read Karl Marx from the 1850s, 60s, whatever, what is astounding is he knew what was going to happen today. How he knew in 1850 about commodification to this degree is an astounding thing. And what he said, he said, capitalism will creep into every nook and crevice of your life. There will be nothing left that has any or integrity or creativity. They will take it all away. So let's think about this. The most profound experience for many women is having a child. Would you agree? Nothing comes close to that. You don't know who you are. You redefine yourself afterwards. What is this body and why are these breasts coming from right round here? And what's leaky? I mean, it's just an amazing thing. But you're not meant to worry about that now. What's meant to be your top concern? Get the Beyonce body back or the Kate Hudson body back or the latest one is the Jessica Simpson. So if you don't lose your baby weight within three minutes of giving birth, you're a fat slob. Now let me tell you, if you had given me a nanny, a cook, a chauffeur, a cleaner, then I too maybe would have gotten back within three minutes. But you know what? In a society that leaves women alone to bring up their children, with, I mean, you've got more support than we've got in the States, okay? You're all nodding here, but let me tell you, you've got heaven here compared to what the States is, okay? Where women are left absolutely isolated after having babies. No collective help, no community help, no government help, nothing. And then, after all of that, you come after them and tell them that the real issue is getting your body back. I mean, that is such a form of violence against women to do that to us. And instead of supporting us, they come after us to this degree. And you know what my students say? They are 18 years old. They're not partnered yet. Some of them will probably never be partnered. I'm going to talk about that later. And they're not thinking about babies, but you're not they're worried about baby weight. At 18 years old, they tell me they're already thinking about their baby weight. And they've not even thought about a baby yet. Now, what I'm talking about is true mainly for white women. When in we get into women of color, especially African-Americans, black women, we get to a different type of representation that I'm going to talk about. Now, I, my assumption is it's not that different in Canada to what I'm going to talk about in the United States. You were not founded the same way on slavery, OK? There's different histories here. But in the United States of America, slavery was the founding moment. It shaped every major institution, from the legal institutions to the economic, to the religion, to the scientific. It is a founding moment. And it is an impossible thing to talk about African Americans today to not go back to the politics of slavery. So what you notice about African American women is they're either very dark or very light. And they're often shown as either animals or close to animals. Do you have that here as well in Canada? OK. So let's talk about where that came from. And again, you need to go back to slavery. During the time of slavery, OK, you had an ideology in the United States of America that this was the place that people came for freedom, to escape oppression. And that took hold as a founding ideological assumption of the United States of America for white people or those coded as white. However, you had a slight problem. Why everyone's talking freedom, what you have in the background is the most systematic form of oppression ever created anywhere, which is slavery. So somehow you have to bring those two clashing ideologies and realities into being. What do you do? You render away the humanity of African Americans. 
So freedom is for white people, but blacks are closer to animals. And biologists argue that they were the missing link between white, between white people and animals. Now also, something else very important. Men have always raped women, as far as we know, and they've hidden it. You couldn't, you couldn't hide it on the plantation. You had first-generation Africans having children. What color is the child of a first-generation African? Dark. But you had clearly mixed-race children running around the plantation. So you had to legitimize it. How did you legitimize it? These poor, upstanding, good Christian plantation owners just could not control themselves in the face of the animal sexuality of these black women. So you took the wholesale rape of black women by the slave owners and you put it on the shoulders of black women. And it worked because you still have the image today in America of black women as whores, Jezebels, all of those things. And much to my sorrow, you have some black performers who also buy into that. Many of them understanding, not them necessarily, but the people who construct their image, what you have to do to sell to a largely white audience. So this is the kind of ideologies that float around. Now this is for women. For men, we have another set of ideologies. Now this is 50 Cent. Now let me tell you, when hip hop rap first came out in the United States of America, for those of us who are progressive, it left us breathless. The reason was nobody else was talking about capitalism and inequality and racism. It was profound. Fight the power, does anyone remember those songs? Things like that. What happened is that whites began to buy hip hop and white corporations began to understand that this was a multi-billion dollar money maker. So in a way, what you have here is blackface being performed by black men. Because blackface, do you all know what blackface is? Used to be performed by white men. But now this is even better. So let's take the 50 cent image. And this is not to blame the black rap artists. Many of them are poor guys who've been pulled out, given enormous contracts, and owned largely by white corporations. Because you know the average hip hop song today is bought by white kids, not black kids in the United States of America. There are hip hoppers for blacks. My students bring in great stuff, but the white kids don't know about it. And I have to tell when my son at 15 brought home his first rap music, I said to him, you're a 15-year-old Jewish kid living in the suburbs. What the hell do you know about ghetto life? <laughs> right? But it's the masculinity. Because today, black men carry the mantle of hyper-masculinity. And the black community pays an enormous price. Because, you see, 50 Cent can afford to develop the thug image. You know why? He lives in a gated community in Connecticut, surrounded by bodyguards. He does not have to deal with the reality of the white police who have internalized the views that young black men are thugs. Sometimes in America, and I don't know if it happens here, when they have killed a black male, they pull out 20 to 30 bullets. When one would have done the trick, or two, what does it say when you've got 20 or 30 bullets in someone? It talks about the overkill and the fear that whites have of blacks. They took 30 bullets to kill him. Right now, these images again continue throughout the culture. So did you, have, did you all see this here? This was a very famous Vogue cover. Now look at the visual grammar of this. Just look at his position and look at her. Now to show you how images profoundly continue to shape our consciousness. What I'd like you to do is look at that, and then I'm going to show you something else. That's the first ever King Kong poster. Now, King Kong is very interesting. King Kong came out in 1933, bang smack in the middle of the major depression. It was the time when blacks were moving from the north 
to the, from the south to the north. They were being blamed for the recession. Now, the story of King Kong is whites discover a black beast in Africa. They get over there. They entice him down by putting a white woman out. And then they drug him and bring him back to America in a ship in chains. Does that sound familiar? OK. When they introduced King Kong into Germany in 1934, they renamed it King Kong and the White Woman. So very clear gender politics. And in fact, if people read my book, I have a whole analysis of King Kong and its relationship to the image of blacks in pornography today, because King Kong was a major, major movie that for many in the North was an incitement to fight against blacks. Now, to move on a bit, to talk about the kind of world that our students live in, our kids. So to do that, I'm going to talk about what I originally wanted to call my book. Now, you don't get to name a book, right? So when I was writing my book, I had a fabulous title. I thought it was fabulous, but the, they wouldn't have it. And the title was Stepford Sluts. Don't you think that's great? OK, yeah. Me too. But the publisher said no. But this was originally going to be my first chapter. I had to, of course, rewrite it when they made me change the name. So the first chapter was going to be that they remade The Stepford Wives in 2006. Did anyone see that? Mess of a film with Nicole Kidman. Well, you all know the story of The Stepford Wife, the sort of you know, um, roboticized, generic, domesticated female, all the same. So my argument was this. In 2006, they remake Stepford Wives. Nobody goes and sees it. It's a terrible film. It's a ridiculous film. Because in 2006, as in today, the idea that the perfect woman is on her hands and knees waxing the kitchen floor is completely ludicrous. The perfect woman today is still on her hands and knees. But she isn't waxing any kitchen floors in that position. She is the one waxed, as in full bikini wax. The Stepford wife has been replaced by the Stepford slut. The generic, homogenized, robotic, hypersexualized female. And this is the world that young women live in now. This is the only offer, the only choice on offer. You've got Lindsay. Oops, this is not. Brittany. Or Paris. Or all the others. Or Pamela. So let's first of all, very important, Paris Hilton. Okay, she is the kind of iconic slut of our generation. And I'm going to talk about what I mean by slut, okay, because I'm not using the regular term, obviously. So let's take her life. So she was a very wealthy woman, not that well known, and then she gets to mega stardom. How? The sex tape, which was made by her boyfriend at the time, who was married and 13 years her senior. She sued to try and stop it, and she couldn't. And it became the best-selling sex tape for two years on the porn market. Now, I want us, instead of thinking of Paris Hilton as a punchline in a joke, I want us to think about the trauma of being 19 years old, and that is circulating everywhere. Just for a moment, what it must have felt like. And then, as most women who are traumatized, there was two choices. You either run and hide and never, ever come out again, or you decide in a kind of pathological way to embrace that trauma and own it as your own. So what she said is, if you're going to call me a slut, then guess what? I'm going to be the best fucking slut you've ever met in your life which is, by the way, a traumatic response to conditions that are out of your control. Now, let me say something. She can pull this off because her millions act as an upmarket cleansing cream. Put the slut label on a white working class girl. Put it on a girl of color. And what studies show, very interestingly, is that girls who get defined as sluts in high school have similar PTSD symptoms to rape victims. 
alcoholism, drug abuse, dropping out of school, vulnerability to early pregnancy, depression, anxiety. Being labelled a slut is a kind of public rape of one's identity. Now, I don't want to suggest the two are obviously the same. What I'm saying is there are some certain dynamics at play because the studies also show that that PTSD lasts right through your life. There's only new research coming out now, and this is the stuff that's coming out. But you don't know that when you're 15. All you know is Paris Hilton makes it work for her. And these are the images that surround you. And let's be honest. For example, has any other woman done more to conform to patriarchy than her, Pamela Anderson? They want bigger breasts, she has bigger breasts. They want flatter stomachs, she has a liposuction. Whatever they say, she does. And what does she get for a prize? Kid Rock. <laughs> All right, that tells you something about prizes on offer. Now I want to talk about the woman who breaks my heart, Anna Nicole Smith. Do you all know who she is? Right. When she died a few years ago, they wanted to do an autopsy. And I wanted to say, don't do an autopsy. I know exactly what this woman died of. She died of a broken heart. She buried her beloved son a few months before she died. Now let me tell you why this hurt me. My son was the same age as her son when her son died. And for those of us who've got children, you know that when you read about a kid dying the same age as your kid, it hits you. And I also remember having a conversation with my son. First of all, when he went off to college, he literally made me sign a contract that I would never speak within 10 miles of his college. And should I do that, he informed me he would transfer instantaneously. Then he said, to, I asked him, I said to him, why did you never come and hear your mother speak? I said, everyone comes from all over to hear me, but you've never heard me. You know what he said? He said, you know what, mum? You really don't want the word mum and the word pornography in the same sentence. <laughs> Is he right? He's dead right. And that got me thinking for Daniel, her son. Can you imagine for one minute what it was like being brought up as the son of the laughingstock whore of the United States of America. Can you imagine what it felt like, the humiliation for this kid? And I think on one level, Anna Nicole Smith understood the way that her limited life chances and exploitation had led to his early death from overdose of God knows how many drugs. And you know what? I think it brought her to her knees and she never got up again because she loved her son and that was a terrible loss for her. And to show you just what fuckers the porn industry is, a few months after her son died, Hustler came out with this cartoon. And it's a joke, and underneath it says, Anna Nicole Smith's son's autopsy. And it reads, we have to invent a cover-up story. All the tests conclude he died of embarrassment. They knew, they knew. And she married a multi-billionaire, you remember that, the 80-odd-year-old? When he died, he left her nothing. She was an uneducated, single mother with no career options. He could have left her enough for her and her son, but he didn't. And she went back into the porn industry and backstripping because she had no money. And yet, even in death, they did not leave this woman alone, how she was referred to. So let me tell you, as a woman, you're fucked whichever way you go. You conform and you're fucked, you don't conform and you're fucked. And there's a wonderful essay by the philosopher Marilyn Fry called Oppression. And in it she says the hallmark of any oppressed group is that you are in a double bind, there is no way out. Whichever way you choose, you're screwed. And indeed, that was the sign for her. Now, I want to talk about Nicole Kidman, who is not a woman with no choices. This is a woman who was an Academy Award, She's got, what, four children now? By all accounts, she seems a serious, thoughtful mother. Do you think she chose this? Do you think she thought, that's how I want to be, so that my kids can maybe walk into a local store and see their mother like that? But you know what? She was turning 40. She was aging out of fuckability. Because I want to suggest that in our society, women have two choices. You're either fuckable or you're invisible. 
And that's why the gym is full of 40 odd year old women who are aging out of fuckability because fuckability has a shelf life, right? It has a shelf life. And so what happens is this is her trying to gain, or rather the, her handlers, her fuckability. And of course, one of the women who invented all of this, who's got no more sense at 50 than she had at 20. <laughs> and then of course, Miley Cyrus. Now, if you want to write a story about the hypersexualization, this is your thesis topic. So let's think about the life of Miley Cyrus. She is a product worth billions as Hannah Montana, all the spin-offs and everything. She's the Disney Hannah Montana. She's squeaky clean. There's a problem. She's aging out of Hannah Montana squeaky clean. She now has to be visible in a world of Rihanna and Beyonce and Lady Gaga and Britney Spears. Hannah Montana is invisible. So she has to be reinvented, Miley Cyrus. Now this is when she was 16 and in comes Annie Lebowitz for Vanity Fair and does a whole series of photo shoots. That's her father, by the way. Now, the most disgusting part of this story was that when there was the outcry, which of course there was gonna be, they pushed 16-year-old Hannah Montana, Miley Cyrus forward, to apologize, as if she had sat down and strategized this whole move. This was a very, very well thought out move from squeaky clean Hannah Montana to fuckable Miley Cyrus. And did it work? Well, the year later, that's L. And interestingly now, she's beginning to balk a bit at this. If anyone's seen her latest image, she's cut all her hair off and she's less... So there's an interesting resistance going on, which I think is quite healthy, actually, is she's refusing to buy into some of this. Of course, her handlers must be going nuts because of all the multi-millions. But this is what happened, and they understood that. This is the dictates of the market for women. You want to be visible, this is what you've got to compete. So let me ask you a question. How do we expect a 14 or 15 or 13 year old girl to negotiate this alone? Your friend, <coughs> your friends are walking around with the low slung jeans, the tramp stamp, the pierced belly button, the midriff showing. What are you to do? Because there's no alternatives on offer. This is all there is. When I was growing up, yes, there was the hypersexualized look, but there was others as well. And I remember one thing with feminism was realizing that one could have a creative sexuality and not conform to this plasticized sexuality. That's what feminism also offered me. But where is it? Feminism's dead, right, in the public arena. It's gone or else you've got this drivel third wave stuff, which is all about empowerment, which I'm gonna talk about later. But real feminism, right, that is resistant and refuses to buy in, that's gone. And so where, what are you gonna do? Because at 14 or 15, your job is to negotiate your way into adulthood. And as a cultural being, the only way you do that is you wander through the culture looking for what it means to be female in this culture. And this is the only place to go. And now what is ludicrous about the new third wave feminism is that they take this lack of choice because this is the only image and have the cheek to call it female empowerment. Right, as if we came up with this. As if a 14 year old sat down and said, now let me think what I wanna be when I grow up. I could be a hypersexualized, plasticized, generic female, or I could be a radical feminist, or maybe I could be this. I think I'll go for the hypersexualized, plasticized female. Right? There's nothing else on offer. And I can tell you, when I'm with 18 to 22 year olds in my classes and I deconstruct it, they get it instantly, instantly, that they have been sold a bill of goods. And when you sexualize children, there's no end, as in these, Vogue. Now, let's talk about the effects of this on girls. And I remember there's a film out there that you should see called The Price of Pleasure. Anyone seen it? About pornography, The Price of Pleasure. And it's a documentary that I'm in with some others on this. 
And we were making this about six, seven years ago. And I remember being filmed for hours, and there was a point where we had to stop the camera because we were trying to figure out the meaning of all of this, and we couldn't. We couldn't get our heads around what was going on. And then a year later, I went to Connecticut State Prison, and I interviewed an incarcerated child rapist, I like to call Dick. And Dick looked at me, and he'd raped his 10-year-old daughter, and Dick had been through a lot of these sort of, you know, rehab things and what have you. So he had the language really down. You know what he said to me? He said, the culture did a lot of the grooming for me. And that suddenly got me. It was like all crystal clear. We live in a perp culture. It used to be you needed an individual groomer to groom an individual girl into hypersexualization. You know, that's how it works. You're all aware of this, I'm sure, because of the work you do. The way that predators hone in on a single child, tell them how great they are and wonderful, and then tell them how sexual they are, and then eventually the only thing that matters is their sexuality, and bang, you've got them bonded, you've got them giving out sex, not telling anyone. But now, the individual perpetrator is helped along by the collective perpetrator of the porn culture. So I think we are training our young girls to be victims in a way we have never trained them before. We are mass perpetrating against them in the form of porn images. So we are turning them into early hypersexualized females who have not been able to develop an authentic sexuality. I mean, think about what one sexuality is. It should be able to grow out of who you are you experiences, etc., but not now. It's thrown at you from the word go. And you know what? The girls, they better get with the act because they are going to have to date the guys whose major form of sex education now is pornography. Now, when I say pornography, I am not talking about Playboy or Penthouse, not even Hustler. Right? Not talking about any of those anymore. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay. I'm not talking about, those were the good old days. What I am going to be talking about today is the mainstream porn industry. You can't read this very well. I'm going to read you some of the statistics. Can we turn the lights down slightly? Is that possible or not? Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, duh. Right. So, the estimated revenue of the porn industry worldwide is about 97 billion dollars. But it's, it's a very rough figure because we don't really know. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to walk you through the porn industry. I am talking about the porn industry today. Now let me say something very clear. We have always had pornography. I am sure from the first time a man realized he could make a stick in the ground and make a sign, we had pornography. We have not always had a porn industry. The porn industry began in 1953 with the first edition of Playboy. That was the first time ever a magazine aimed to be pornographic in the sense that it delivered facilitators for male masturbation. It is the first time ever that those magazines circulated within mainstream capitalist channels. It has never happened before. So I want us to think about a porn industry. Just as when you go and buy a hamburger, it did not drop from the sky. You understand? It came out of the fast food industry. And I want to argue that porn is to sex what McDonald's is to food. Okay? I also want to say that if some of you go into YouTube or Google, you are going to see me described as anti-sex, need a good fuck, hate sex, etc., etc. So I want to say something. If I was here today to talk about the fast food industry, if I was to suggest the problems with the fast food industry in terms of obesity, destruction to the environment, ill health, would anyone accuse me of being anti-eating? <laughs> would you? So why, when I talk about the porn industry, am I accused of being anti-sex? I'll tell you why. It's the perfect PR of the porn industry. They have collapsed porn into sex. It's not. It is a representation of sex made in an industrial setting 
with a particular profit motive in mind. Very, very different. 10,000 porn fans and me land in Las Vegas. <laughs> so off I go, and it's just the most bizarre thing you've ever seen. Imagine a football field, much bigger than this room, hardcore pornography everywhere, blasting at you, women walking around with barely any clothes because you've got all the pimps pimping out their stable to the pornographers. And, I, and at that time, it was before my book was out, so they didn't know me. Now I couldn't pull it off, but then I could. So I go up to um, Real Dolls. You all know Real Dolls? $6,000 a doll with op anal openings, right, vagina. You decide the colour of the pubic hair if you want any. You even decide what colour nail polish the doll has. So I'm talking to this guy, and I mean, and I'm pretending to be a journalist, neutral. And I said, so I said, why, why do you think men buy these dolls? So he looks me straight in the face. He said, it helps them develop relationships with women. <laughs> this is what he says to me. And then I said something, and he said to me, um, are you being judgmental? So I said, no, I'm just interested. Then he's giving me all this bullshit, because everyone's pro-porn, so they expect us, I'm just pretending to write this bullshit down. And I said to him, um, by the way, I said, do you fuck the dolls? He says, what? I said, do you fuck the dolls? He says, oh, I, I would never do that. I said, oh, and who's being judgmental now, right? <laughs> anyway, then I said to him, have you heard of the film Lars and the Real Girl? Anyone seen that? With Ryan? He said, have we heard of it? He said, we were the consultants, and the day the film came out, our website crashed because so many men went on it. Okay? So that is the level of connection between. And I have to tell you, of all the bizarre things that I saw, and I tell you, I saw a lot of bizarre things, a few interesting things that I start my book off with one of the most interesting stories there, is I was like, about, if you feel, you feel like you're falling down a rabbit hole when you enter this world of the pornographers, okay? Where everything you take to be normal is upside down. And I ended up, the only people I could speak to who had any semblance of humanity compared to the rest of them were actually the security guards. And who were they? African-American women on minimum wage who did not know that this was their detail. They had never seen porn before, okay? And this was what they were forced to sit in. Anyway, so I basically bonded with them because we were the only like five in the room who were not crazy like the porn industry. And um, as I'm talking to them and sort of figuring out what's going on in there, and some of them were, and they were shocked. One of the women had a crink in her neck because she said, I've been looking down for eight hours so I don't have to watch the pornography. And what was interesting because of community was how upset they were to see black porn performers. Because they kept telling me, go over there, tell her you're a professor, and tell her to stop doing this, because she won't listen to me, okay? So anyway, but of all the bizarreness, you know the most bizarre thing was? Bang smack in the middle of all of this pornography. You know what you've got? Dentists setting up teeth whitening. I mean, how do you make any sense of this, right? And then there's one guy there who's not in the porn industry, quite a few of them, he sells the lighting for the porn industry. And he's excitedly telling me how great his lights are because they don't melt the makeup. And here we are, you know, surrounded by this insanity. So I'm chatting along. And I said, oh, have you got children? He says, yes, I've got three girls. I said, oh, how nice. I said, um, how do you feel working for an industry that's endangering their lives? And that wiped the smile off his face immediately. <laughs> because, you know, they don't think, didn't realize who he's interfacing with here, OK? So that's the industry. I'm going to run through. Now, what I want to talk about is what the industry looks like today. There is a concept in the business studies world called the dominant design. And what this means is that as industries mature, as they mature, they develop what's called the dominant design. They come out with a standardized design. The pornography industry is now what economists call a maturing industry in that it has developed into two different types. Now, first of all, when you interview a pornographer, nobody talks about softcore or hardcore. Those are not the terms pornography uses. Why? Because today, softcore porn has migrated into pop culture. It no longer exists. What you are left with is only hardcore. 
When you put porn into Google, you come up with two things. Now, the first type is what we call feature porn, which is an attempt to mimic a Hollywood movie. An hour and a half storyline, but it's hardcore sex. Now, what the industry says, and what my interviews show, is that men use feature porn as a way to socialize their girlfriends into porn sex. Because what the industry says is when the men are alone and the best seller in the internet is not feature, it's what we call gonzo. Now, gonzo is your hardcore, cruel, in your face. This is one of the grandfathers of gonzo. His name is Max Hardcore, and I'm going to read you his website. I force girls to drink my piss, fist fuck them, ream their asses, and drill their throats until they puke. Now, when I first started doing this research 20 years ago, no pornographer would own Max Hardcore. They wouldn't come near him. He was too far out. When I went to Las Vegas, he had the biggest stand in the middle of the hall. He had the most people sat lining up for him for signatures and signings. And he was recently on the Howard Stern Show. So if you want evidence of his mainstream now, it's that. So what I did when I did my book was I decided I am going to follow the breadcrumbs of a 12-year-old boy who doesn't have a credit card but puts porn into Google. And I'm going to tell you now what are the most visited sites, and I'm going to show you the, the themes. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. There is empirical research to show that what I found is exactly true. So, first of all, the first thing you notice in pornography, there's no such thing as a woman. There's lots of bitches, whores, cunts, and cum, cum dumpsters. No women. The reason for that is because the level of abuse and violence is so profound that you have to make sure that that guy who is jerking off to that woman does not look for one minute into her eyes and see a human being because it might kill his erection stone dead. So basically, pornography is full of women, not like you and I, right? Because we wouldn't do this shit. Full of whores, bitches, cunts. The image men have of a woman in porn is that somehow one day she wandered accidentally onto a porn site and she said, oh my God, people do this for a living? I've been looking for this all my life. <laughs> right? That's not how they end up there. You end up in pornography as a choice because you've got no other choices. That's how you get there. And when you've got no other choice, it's completely not meaningful to call it a choice. It's the same with prostitution. The entry age into prostitution in the United States of America is 13 to 14. Now, I did not see, when I was in Las Vegas, women with law degrees or PhDs lining up to be in pornography. It is drawn largely from the working class, from women with fewer options, and the recession, where you're living in the middle of nowhere and you're looking at minimum wage, it looks attractive. Why? Because Gemma Jameson made it work for her. Sasha Gray made it work for her. Little do you know that the average shelf life is three months. I'm going to talk about what actually happens to you on the set. So I'm going to take you through now the major sex acts. The first one that is in every single gonzo, which is the hallmark of gonzo, is gagging with a penis. Now what they do is they put the penis so far down the throat that it actually activates the gag reflex. They put a lot of mascara on the women so that when you see the tears, you have actual evidence of the tears running down her face. Some cases, she vomits, but she is choking. And let me tell you, when I watch it, it activates me. I start choking, just listening to her choking. She's actually choking. And they like you to look at them. So as she's choking, he's got his penis ramming down her throat. She's choking, and he's saying, look at me, bitch, look at me. Now, if you were to think about a man choking a woman sexually, and him have no empathy whatsoever and continue, we would call that psychopathic behavior, am I right? The inability to have any empathy. Pornography is full of men who, if you were to diagnose them, would basically di be diagnosed as psychopathic because of their inability to show empathy. Gagging is key. Sometimes they take it one step further. They stick her underwear in her mouth and they hold her nose so she really can't breathe. And this is an example 
on gag me and fuck me what they say. Do you know what we say to things like romance and foreplay? We say fuck off. This is not another site with half a rat wieners. <coughs> we take gorgeous young bitches and do what every man would really like to do. We make them gag till their makeup stops running <coughs> and they get all whole sore and then we give them a sticky bath. Now, let's think about this. Just look how clever this is. We do what we know every man would really like to do. So let's take a 12 or 13 year old boy. He puts porn into Google. He thinks he's gonna see breasts. He comes up with this. I think of what my son would have been like at 12 or 13 to come up with this. But wait, he's trying to develop his masculinity. Notice what they say. We do everything that men really wanna do. It's throwing out a challenge to him, isn't it? Are you man enough for this? And you tell me what 13-year-old boy is going to say, oh, no. So what I actually think is that when young boys and some men look at this, there is a trauma reaction mixed with a sexual reaction. All right? There's something going on that's more complicated than just erections and ejaculations. The second major issue, the second major theme is anal sex. Now, in porn, the goal of anal sex is to deliver to her the message just what a filthy, stinking whore she really is. Now, the goal is to hurt her and really hurt her, as in this. We, a pure filth, know exactly what you want, and we're giving it to you. Chicks being as fucked till their sphincters are pink, puffy, and totally blown out. Adult diapers just might be in store for these whores when their work is done. This is the promotional copy, right? This isn't something, I didn't have to look very long. This is like two minutes, you're into this. Then the standard porn is three men and one woman. She's being orally, anally, and vaginally penetrated at the same time, pounding away. As they are spitting in her face, pulling her hair and calling her every disgusting, vile name imaginable. And then the end is ejaculation, all three, into her mouth. She has to then open her mouth to show the ejaculate, and then she has to swallow it. Okay? This is standard porn. Gone is Playboy, gone is Penthouse, can't find that anymore. ATM, ass to mouth. Standard here is the penis goes into the anus and then straight into the mouth without washing. The idea is the bitch has to eat shit. This is also standard now. Now let me tell you about the women in porn. Three months is their shelf life, why? Their bodies simply cannot tolerate this. They just can't tolerate it. So what they have, one of the biggest problems with women in porn is anal prolapses. Their anuses literally drop out of their body, repeated having to sew the anuses up. Chlamydia of the eye, gonorrhea of the anus. These are pretty standard. This is from the Adult, Adult Industry Medical Healthcare Association, which was a voluntary run association, which has now been closed. This was on their website telling performers what kind of diseases they were susceptible to through pornography. And the racism, as in pimp my black tea. As in long dong black Kong. As in eight street Latinas. This is about men who go around finding undocumented women and promising them green cards if they'll agree to have sex with them. And of course, the idea of trafficking in women. Now, we have a problem. If you didn't think we have a problem then, we have a bigger problem now. This is an interview with Jules Jordan, who is a very, very hardcore pornographer. And he wrote, one of the things about today's porn, an extreme market, the gonzo market, so many fans want to see so much more extreme stuff that I'm always trying to figure out how to do something differently. What he's saying is that they cannot keep up with the violence that the fans want. 
Now they have a problem, and I'll tell you what the problem is. The problem is that this is a multi-billion dollar a year industry. They have to keep within the law. They can't kill her because now really there's nothing short, there's nothing left to do to her. They have done everything conceivable you can do to the female body and men want more. So they have to stay within the law, but they don't know what to do. So what do they do? They change the law. In 2003, the Free Speech Coalition went to the Ashcroft Supreme Court and basically said that the 1997 Child Pornography Protection Act was too broad. What did that act say? That act said that A, nobody under 18 could be in porn, and B, nobody who locked under 18. The Free Speech Coalition, the lobbying body of the porn industry, said that limited the free speech of the pornographers and they should be allowed to have women in who look under 18. The Ashcroft Supreme Court agreed. And overnight, you saw the absolute explosion of images like this. Overnight, where they bring in women. I'm sure she's 18 because this is legal, right? They don't want to sort of mess with the law. But they make them look young. So now you have images like this. First time with daddy. Daddy's whore. It's okay, she's my stepdaughter. Now let me tell you what's going on. And I don't think we've ever been in this position before. When I went to that Connecticut prison, I interviewed eight men, all of whom were in for either downloading child pornography or for, raping a, or for downloading and raping a child. Now, I want you to get your head around something. Not one of them was a pedophile. They had never touched a child till their 30s and 40s. They all preferred sex with adult women. When I said to them, are you pedophiles, they were upset with me. So I said, well, why? You know, I, I don't want to point anything out here, but you're in for raping children and child pornography. You know what they said? We got bored, wanted something different. They were not that interested in children. Now, any of you who work with pedophiles, right, knows that they start around, what, 14, 15, 16? By their 30s, how many kids have they left in their wake? These guys began in their 30s and 40s. And for my guys, the length between the first access to child porn and raping a child was a year. For some, it was less. Now. I, when I give this, you might be shocked, okay? When I speak to therapists who deal with men who use porn habitually, they say, of course they do. We hear this all the time. You know what else they said to me, something else I hadn't heard recently? They get so habituated, they even start abusing the family pets, sexually abusing the family pets. Right? It, it's so out of control, all of this. And what's interesting is they are not addicted to Playboy or Penthouse. They are addicted to Gonzo. It is that mix of sex with violence that is so toxic that causes habituation. Now, I'm going to end in a minute because I can see that everyone's about to die, so I want to talk. So what's the answer? This is an image from Maxim, which says how you cure a feminist. to this is a radical feminist approach right it's the only answer and one that includes men as well because I want to say something to men and when I've got a lot of men in the audience I say this to them I say to the men you might not know this but feminists are your best friends we are the only one rooting for your humanity we are the only ones who say you're worth better than this because you know what my son is worth better than this and if my son is worth better than this, then I'm sure your sons are worth better than this. Right? How dare you define my son as a predator who doesn't give a shit about women and he's willing to gag women and have no empathy? That's not my son. And so what I argue to men is don't be upset with me. I'm your friend. It's them who are defining you, not me. So the solution to this, and I am telling you, I think 
This is one of our public health emergencies of the day. And if it is not now, it will be in a couple of years. We are, you cannot, everything I know about sociology, everything I have studied for years, tells me that you cannot bring up boys whose first entry into this is now 11.5 years old. You cannot bring them up on this and not have it play out in the real world. How it will play out, some will rape and become sexual sadists, some will just rape and not sadists, some will nag their girlfriends, but mostly what you're doing is destroying the capacity for intimacy in men. This is what my students tell me, that the men they mix with cannot get connected. They said they feel like they are babysitting when they go out with men their own age. And the men, by the way, will not date. It's hookup sex today. And the students tell me that when they have hookup sex, the men will not kiss them because kissing is too intimate. So this is where we're leading. Now, if somebody thinks this is not going to have an effect, you're going to have to explain that to me. You're going to have to explain to me how you can live in a culture saturated with pornography and how people ignore these messages. Because we know from psychology and from history and from sociology, the founding assumptions of all of these are that we are cultural beings who are affected by our culture. We do not come into this society with a ready-made sexuality. When my son turned, I think it was 12, I said to him, you know what? I said, I cannot be with you all the time. And you are going to have to make a decision whether you look at porn or not, because your friends are going to show you. I said, it's going to be your choice, but I want you to think about something before you make a choice. I said, you do not know yet whether you are straight, you are gay, you are bi, you do not know what your sexuality looks like. You are going to grow into it in ways that make sense for you and your experiences and your peer group and who you are. I said, but should you look at pornography? They are going to steal something from you that you don't yet own. And that is a terrible thing to give away because you have a right to an authentic sexuality. You know what? We all have a right to that. But our daughters have a right to that. And I am telling you, the world they are living in is not the world that you and I grew up in. And as adults, we have to start taking responsibility because adults on some level have abdicated. My students tell me no one has helped them with this. No one has helped them negotiate what does it mean to come of age as a young woman in a hypersexualized porn culture. They are thrown into it and they just can't survive it. They are depressed, they feel hopeless, they feel like they've been robbed of a sexuality that is creative and fun and all the things that we want it to be. So I've come here today to say that if we do not take this on as a movement, and it is not an individual thing because you do not fight corporations person by person, you do it as a collective movement. So I've come here today to say that, and I want to end by saying that I was interviewed by a Canadian broadcasting company, and actually your interviews are so much better than the ones in America, right? They actually read the books in this country. <laughs> so he said to me at the end, he said, Gail Dines, he said, it was the Sunday morning guy from CBS, CBC, does anyone remember? Yeah, yeah. And he said to me, Gail Dines, he said, are you not pushing a boulder up a hill? And I said, yes. That's of course of what I'm doing. I'm pushing a boulder up a hill. I said, and that's what you do to make the world livable. The feminist movement pushed boulders up hills so women would have a life. The civil rights movement pushed boulders up hills so people of color and everyone would have a life. The labor movement pushed boulders up hills so workers would not be exploited. This is what you do to make the world worth living in. You push a boulder up a hill. This is one big fucking boulder. I'm telling you that absolutely. But with your help, I'm sure we can do it. Thank you.